brilliant thanks so much jacob for asking me inviting me and uh everyone for for coming uh what this i mean also i guess so i haven't thought about this stuff for a bit uh and then i got the email from jacob and i thought okay this is like the perfect time to just come back and read the more recent literature on this and the more recent literature as I take it or at least a bunch of papers that I'll be talking about are defending naturalness in a particular way there have been sort of philosophical defenses of the kind of autonomy or emergence or argument for naturalness and that's what I'm going to go through and what I'm really doing this is a work in progress I'm asking questions and I'm asking questions of like, how good are these arguments and what we should do with them, how we should think of them philosophically. So this is like a philosopher's, philosopher of emergence or reduction take and analysis in these arguments. I'm not really giving you physics details. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know about the physics. I'm just trying to sort of pick through the philosophy quite carefully and hopefully raise some kind of interesting questions to which I don't have the answers. One thing that I'm really hoping is that this audience will have the answers. So these aren't sort of, you know, rhetorical questions. These are questions to which I don't know the answer, but I, I'm hoping some other people will, that then you'll be able to tell me the answer and then I'll be able to write the paper and the paper will have all the answers. That, 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 that's the way this should go. Okay, excellent. Um, so, starting broadly. Oh, sorry, the other thing I meant to say is that Ariana's talk gave us a really great kind of flavor of how these arguments are used by physicists. I'm not really gonna be engaging with the physics literature in that sense, in that I'm just gonna sort of do the second order thing of thinking about what other philosophers have said based on the kind of physics arguments rather than thinking about the physicists' arguments themselves. But I'd be very interested to have the discussion of how the kind of things that I will say relate to the ways in which these, have been, these problems on these questions or these arguments have been thought about by physicists. Okay, good. So considerations of naturalness in high energy physics have been used to motivate theoretical and experimental research. The apparent unnaturalness of the standard model has led to a number of philosophy papers in very recent years, both for and against. And there are a particular subset of these arguments that have talked about emergence or autonomy arguments for naturalness. So I think, I don't, I'm not sure, I obviously haven't seen Josh's talk, but based on Josh's recent work on this, I think he'll be arguing slightly differently, talking about a slightly different argument for naturalness. I'm going to be speaking about emergence or autonomy arguments for naturalness, so how these relate is very interesting, of course. So my goal is, right, um, I don't know how many people here have been to talks by Harvey Brown. I, I'm hoping this will be a, like a, a very poor mimic of the kind of talk he gives where he asks incredible questions uh, uh, without always giving the kind of detailed answers. Okay. So following David Wallace in his 2019 paper, Naturalness is Capitalized, and I'm only discussing one version of the notion. I'm not arguing for a particular viewpoint. I think it's an empirical question. And what I'm gonna try and motivate is that it's an empirical question which we don't yet have the answer to, whether or not the world is natural. However, insofar as this criterion is being used to guide, as a guide to research, I kind of think that we should analyze the arguments in favor of the criterion and see what they assume and establish. And then, you know, we can adjust our credence. If it turns out that we have just a huge amount of theoretical weight or associated theoretical assumptions that we have to give up if we give up on naturalness. And it looks like we should put a lot more credence in those theories that give us some chance of restoring naturalness to our physics. Okay, so some of what I discuss here is based in my uh, paper called, pretentiously titled, When's the Effectiveness of Effective Field Theories? Um, that was accepted in 2018, despite it coming out in 2020. So more recent stuff, I'll be responding to that. And also Sabine Hossenfelder's work on this, I think is really inspiring and interesting. Okay, so no plan. Give you a little bit of preliminaries, then I'll talk through the arguments for naturalness, and then I'll sort of develop some questions and worries about such arguments as we go. Two and three are interlaced. 
within the rest of the talk. Okay. Good. So, what are effective field theories? Effective field theories are theories with limited domains of applicability. So, what I mean is that we take these theories to apply within some domain and not apply outside that domain. So they represent some details of the world in some way or other, up to some length scale. Maybe they're cut off at both ends, or maybe they just sort of do everything down to some length scale. You know, either way, we can think about them as not purporting to describe the world fundamentally. So if we want to kind of what's often called the top down construction, we want to think about what AFTs are, we can think of starting out with a Lagrangian for quantum field theory and integrating out the high energy modes. So what you do is you start with some putatively more fundamental theory, you discard some details, and then you get a more limited theory. You develop a low energy theory with limited range, leave that reference to higher energy particles and associated stuff. So such a theory will, in principle, generate accurate predictions for energy regimes below the mass of the integrated out heavier particles. So we can think of it like this. These are the only equations in my talk. I said I'm not doing physics, I'm doing philosophy here. So um, just this is how you can think about it. You can think about some set of couplings and some set of mass terms represented by the green function. You can think of it as the vacuum expectation value of a set of fields. Um, this is below some high energy, super high energy cutoff lambda. If you then want to think below a kind of the next lower cutoff, you want to uh, think about below some capital M, then you can get rid of the particles with masses higher than that. And you can get rid of the couplings with masses higher than that. And then you renormalize in order to modify all your couplings. So what you do is you start out describing a kind of more general, putatively more fundamental part of the world, and then you modify all your couplings, you leave out, you abstract away from the higher energy details, and you can redo your physics with a lower energy theory. That's the kind of way of thinking about this and I'm going with. And it's important for what I'm gonna say in the rest of the talk, that what's involved in coming up with effective field theories is in part abstracting away or ignoring or discarding or throwing away details which correspond to some higher energy scale. Now exactly what goes on in that throwing away or discarding process I think is something that I don't fully understand and I'd really like to ask some questions about in a bit. Okay, so Following Porter Williams, he's got two papers on this, 2015 paper and then the 2018 paper in which he talks about two notions of naturalness. First notion in that paper, in a natural theory, parameters defined at low energies are fairly insensitive to values of parameters defined at high energies. Okay, so this is a very rough approach, way of thinking about naturalness that I'm gonna use. If parameters in a theory depend extremely sensitively on parameters defined in higher energy theories, that theory is unnatural. If the para parameters of higher energy are slightly changed, a natural low energy theory will be unaffected. However, for an unnatural low energy theory, such changes will lead to changes at low energy. So this can be to an incredibly striking extent. It might be that changing the 20th significant figure at high energy would be sufficient to vary the low energy value. That's what we mean by unnaturalness being striking and surprising. Just the 20th significant figure varying at high energy can lead to changes at low energy. This is a kind of coupling or relationship between length scales that I'm going to be carrying on talking about in a moment. Okay, so that's what naturalness is. I'm not going to say much more about renormalizability in general, though this is required in order to make sense of these relations between effective field theories that I've been talking about. So it's in the background, but in general, I think we can think about autonomy in the kind of absence of this and then come back to it. In general, renormalization allows us to absorb the dependencies on high energy facts into correction to parameters. So when I talked about discarding or throwing away high energy details, that's a consequence of processes involving renormalization. For an unnatural theory, 
those dependencies are extremely precise, sensitive, and the corrections are incredibly precise. So the corrections involved in renormalization are incredibly precise for unnatural theories. But nonetheless, we can still do this whole process of discarding the high energy details in some sense, we can still abstract away from the high energy in order to move to a lower energy theory through renormalization. So unnaturalness does not preclude renormalizability. It nonetheless requires that renormalizability is very, very precise. Okay. So, good. That was the preliminary. That was the preliminary done. Here are the arguments. So I'm going to talk about three arguments from Porter Williams, from Jonathan Bain, and from David Wallace. I'm going to talk, talk about each in turn. So Porter Williams has argued that naturalness has a deep connection to the EFT dogma and the autonomy of scales. So the suggestion is that we have reasons based on other effective field theories, other theories, maybe just like general science to expect naturalness because naturalness corresponds to some kind of theoretical desideratum. The kind of thing that we want of our theories is that theories defined at different scales are autonomous from one another. This is what we learn from the success of effective field theory, he tells us. That effective field theories work so well is because theories at different scales kind of decouple, they're autonomous, they come apart. And so the success of the effective field theory program, the FT dogma, comes from. So obviously, sorry, I mean, just to, to repeat the caveat I said earlier, all of these arguments, Porter Williams does like a in-depth historical analysis. I'm not saying that he's the source of these arguments, he's the philosophical source I'm talking about. So I'm not claiming that this is his innovation in particular, I'm just, what's really nice actually about Ariana's talk was that um, she showed us the kind of flexibility, flex, is that a word? Whatever, uh, flexibleness uh, of, of, of the naturalness heuristic. And then philosophers come along and they try to be really precise. So while I agree that physicists shouldn't be held down to saying incredibly precise things about these kind of arguments, philosophers should be, philosophers should be rigorous. So I'm taking the philosopher's version of these kind of arguments and attributing it to philosophers when in fact it does come from, from physicists. Okay, good. That caveat said. Um, so what Williams does is he says, We've got this kind of expectation from the success of effective field theories and the effective field theory program. And that gives us reason to expect naturalness, which is that scales are autonomous from one another. So my central worry about this, and I come back to this argument about Bain's argument, this worry about Bain's argument, is that the standard model with the Higgs is an unnatural effective field theory. And it was constructed without knowledge of any more fundamental theory. So what more could you want from autonomy of scales or the EFT dogma? Surely we were thinking about the EFT dogma wrong and we were thinking about autonomy of scales if we thought that autonomy of scales and the EFT dogma warranted naturalness when in fact we have successfully come up with unnatural effective field theories. The EFT dogma can't be requiring that our theories are natural if, the, if, if we have unnatural effective field theories that we know about in the absence of knowing the kind of corresponding underlying beyond standard model physics. Okay, so to give Porter's arguments in a bit more detail, ultimately I claim the reason that failures of naturalness are problematic is that they violate a central dogma of the effective field theory approach, that phenomena at widely separated scales should decouple, this central dogma is well supported both theoretically and empirically. So what's the support of this dogma? Of course, people think that they, or they would have thought that we would get something like naturalness, but it's not supported by the empirical success of the EFT program in principle. So he again says, these apparently distinct formulations of naturalness can be motivated most compellingly by understanding them as capturing distinct aspects of the underlying expectation, the quantum field theory respects an autonomy of scales principle. Okay, so to be fair to him, he goes on, he says, 
it's a defeasible motivation for employing Matronus. He talks about, you know, the spirit and the letter of the EFT dogma. He, he hedges it in an appropriate way. But it looks like the autonomous scales is meant to be providing us an argument for Matronus. And yet, like I agree with Porter that had no unnatural effective field theory be discovered, we would have reasonable expectations that parameters would respect the autonomy of scales. So we would have the reasonable expectation that knowledge of lower energy parameters wouldn't give us ridiculously precise specification of high energy parameters. But given that we now know it's possible to discover and develop our natural effective field theories, what should we do with that argument? What should we do with the autonomy argument for naturalness? It's not clear that we need it in order to come up. In fact, it's clear that we don't need it in order to successfully construct effective field theories. So what of it? So the ability to construct low energy theories is as much autonomy or emergence as we should have ever expected. That's what we've learned. That's what the failure of naturalness in the standard model has taught us, is that we didn't need this kind of autonomy of scales in order to, for the EFT dogma to go through. So why think the world is more autonomous? Okay, good. I'm going to say some similar things about Bain. So Jonathan Bain argues that while unnatural effective field theories are decoupled from the corresponding high energy theories, he calls this heuristic decoupling, which corresponds to a formal distinctness. He says such theories are unattractive because they don't qualify as emergent on a particular analysis of emergence. So he says, we should want naturalness. The paper's called Why Be Natural. He says, we should want natural because natural theories emerge while as unnatural theories don't emerge in the same way. So emergence for Bain involves robust dynamical independence. Unnatural theories fail this because there is sensitive dependence between the high and low energy parameters. Right, we've got extremely sensitive dependence between high and low energy parameters. And so we don't have what Bain calls robust dynamical independence. So in a moment, I'm going to query this. Okay, so Bain concludes. And again, look, everyone's very careful. No one's really committing themselves to more than they should be. He says, if our empirically successful EFT does not exhibit nat naturalness, this should give us pause in characterizing the phenomenon in question as emergent. And to be fair, I don't really disagree with this, but I think it's given us pause. And now I think we could we can say, well, it's all right, it's emergent. Okay, so similarly to Williams, the question is what kind of emergence are we to have expected? We have enough to construct a low energy unnatural EFT, so what more is required? On what basis should we expect more autonomy than that? And I don't know. And I'd be really interested to see if people think that something like these kind of emergence or autonomy arguments can go through when they say unnatural EFTs aren't emergent or aren't autonomous enough. Okay, to be a little bit more analytic, it's controversial obviously to define emergence. So I have a paper there in the knots on this. And so, and, 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 and Jeremy Butterfield and Cara Crowther and lots of people use something like novelty and robustness, okay? So let's put novelty to one side. Relevant question here, if we want to be a bit more analytic about what kind of robustness is required for emergence? Okay, so I want to make a distinction between two kinds of robustness. Okay. So dynamical robustness. Let's think about a gas. A gas can have the same pressure, even if two particles are swapped their velocity. These are the physical changes that are irrelevant to the macrodynamic, which the gas undergoes. So this is the dynamical robustness or screening off aspect of emergence. If you've got the pressure, if you can condition on the prep, conditionize on the pressure, you can screen off the exact microstate, and you can think of two different microstates as interchangeable for our gas. Okay. This is closely related to the fact that a range of different initial conditions all lead to the same macrodynamics for the gas. So whatever your initial conditions is, as long as it's within some range, you get the same macrodynamics for the gas. And so it looks like this is 
Dynamical robustness is a significant part of what's involved in the emergence of the gap. So dynamical robustness, we can imagine sort of dynamical changes at the lower level to which the macro higher level dynamics are irrelevant with respect to which we just don't worry. Okay. Another kind of robustness, gnomic robustness. Consider the emergence of classical mechanics from special relativity. So we can describe the classical dynamics without knowing the speed of light. In special relativistic contexts, obviously the particular value of the speed of light makes a difference to relativistic effects. In classical contexts, the dynamics is robust, gnomically, so gnomic coming from law. So it's robust with respect to counter-legal, changes which are against the law, changes which the laws don't know. We don't have laws that talk about variation in the value of the speed of light. But if the speed of light were to change, classical mechanics wouldn't care, as long as within some, you know, reasonable range of variation. So that's gnomic robustness and dynamical robustness. Unnatural theories are significantly less gnomically robust than we would have expected, given other theories. That is, if we think about changes in the parameters, the change that I was talking about before, when I said the value of high energy corresponding to the Higgs mass at low energy could change by one part in, 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 in uh, the, the, the 20th significant figure. That's the kind of change that we don't currently have dynamics that we imagine changing. And so that seems to be a kind of gnomic robustness. And the question is, why should we expect our theories to be robust with respect to changes in high energy parameters if we don't have dynamics for such parameters to change. So I agree that we would have expected the same kind of thing we have in special relativity, where our low energy theories are gnomically robust or robust against changes in the laws of higher energies. But what's the status of that expectation? Are there good reasons to demand this kind of robustness? Or do we just need something like dynamical robustness, like we have in gases? So are unnatural theories gnomically robust? No, they're not gnomically robust in the sense that the parameters of higher energy changes to them on ones to which, with respect to which our lower energy theories are robust. But are they dynamically robust? Are there underlying physical changes that EFTs are robust with respect? I think this is a very difficult question, and I'd be really interested to see what people think about it. So it seems like the fact that they're not gnomically robust doesn't undermine the ability to come up with low energy or relatively low energy effective field theories at work that are successful. But are there underlying physical changes effect field theories are robust with respect? We don't have gnomic robustness, but do we have dynamical robustness? So you might think there must be, because there are stable macrodynamics. And if effective field theories were, unlike a gas, sensitive to some kind of underlying physics, then we wouldn't have stable macrodynamics. So you might think that like there must be some kind of underlying physics the effective field theories, even unnatural effective field theories, are robust with respect to. So in the gas case, we wouldn't have stable macrodynamics if the precise initial condition or the precise microstate mattered for what happened to our system. So in an effective field theory, do we have anything like dynamic robustness in that sense? Such theories are generally understood in terms of vacuum expectation values. So Physically, how can we understand the sort of micro level changes in an allergy to in the gas case? In the gas case, we have the conceptual resources to make sense of dynamical robustness because we can think about the particles and we can think about interchanging velocities of two different particles. I don't know if we even have the conceptual resources to make sense of dynamical robustness in the EFT case, but I'd be really interested to hear people's thoughts about that. So if effective field theories are dynamically robust, perhaps high energy parameters represent some of the details abstracted away. 
Maybe there are kind of underlying micro details that we abstract away and dynamically robust effective field theories are dynamically robust because the high energy parameters don't matter. But the fact that we have stable macrodynamics for unnatural effective field theory seems to undermine this claim. So it can't really be that the parameters are representing the things that don't matter because we have successful theories which are unnatural, so which are highly coupled between the parameters, and yet they don't have, uh, and, and, and yet such parameters, so such high energy parameters can't be abstracted away in this relevant sense. So it doesn't look like the stability of our macrodynamics can depend on such high energy parameters being abstracted away. Okay, good. So maybe, maybe the dynamical robust, and maybe EFTs are dynamically robust with respect to something else, or maybe they're not dyna dynamically robust at all. Either way, that says nothing about naturalness. So the link between robustness with respect to changes in parameters and naturalness is lost. If it's the case that EFTs are dynamically robust with respect to new physics, or they're not dynamically robust at all, then we lose this connection between robustness, you know, emergence autonomy, and naturalness. Okay. Where does all of this leave Williams and Bain's argument? If EFT is unlike other theories with respect to dynamical robustness, if they just emerge in different ways from other theories, then the inductive generalizations in favor of naturalness don't really work. When you have an argument of the form, all of our theories have been like this up to this point, therefore our new theory should be natural. That kind of argument doesn't really work. That kind of argument presupposes some underlying commonality between our old theories and our new theories. If our new theories, if our unnatural EFTs or our EFTs altogether, and not dynamically robust in the way that our other theories were, then maybe we don't have good grounds for making the inductive generalization, for inferring from features of our old theories to the features of our new theories. Okay, good. So, what is Flipsy's arguments around? He claims that unnatural EFTs are too emergent. So if you think about it, what Williams and Baines were both doing, what Williams and Bain were both doing, is they were both saying effective field theories aren't autonomous or emergent enough. They're not sort of sufficiently decoupled from our lower energy, from our higher energy physics. Wallace, on the other hand, claims that unnatural effective field theories are too emergent. This seems to me to be a better argument. Of course, effective field theories are emergent. We have them, we don't have the high energy theory. Of course they emerge. Of course they're as autonomous and emergent as we would expect them to be. But are they, are they too emergent? In the sense that what we have, very hand wavy way, what we have is our low energy physics constraining how our high energy physics is. Which Wallace develops the argument that this undermines reducibility. Okay, I'll go through the argument in a second. So according to Wallace, unnatural effective field theories are strongly emergent, and this involves a kind of top-down constraint, where the low energy mass of our particle, low energy mass of the Higgs, constrains what goes on at extremely high energy scales. And that violates the kind of bottom-up derivability that I'll talk about in a moment. Okay. So taking stock, I've argued that unnatural effective field theories are at least as emergent and autonomous as we should expect, because we got these low energy effective field theories that are unnatural and we were able to construct them in ignorance of the high energy physics. For the rest of the time, I'll consider Wallace's claims that unnatural effective field theories are strongly emergent. So I'll spell out the argument that they're not derivable from the bottom up. I'll suggest this rests on this subtle distinction between parameters and initial conditions. And I'll consider Wallace's reading and the skepticism about this distinction, and then I'll end with some more questions. Okay, good. So 
although I'm in a room on my own, I tend to shout quite a lot because that's how I give lectures. So <laughs> I get so exhausted giving lectures to undergrad. Anyway, <laughs> here we go. Um, reduction between physical theories. Following Nagel is generally taken to involve two steps. So this is old, old school philosophy of science. You connect the theories, you then derive the, um, there's a terminological confusion. So I keep, whenever I say high and low, I need to specify whether I'm talking about energy or levels. Um, but yeah, higher level is like lower energy, lower level is higher energy. Okay, fine. So higher level laws are derived from lower level laws using the principles. So you connect term to term, you know, standard example, you connect uh, kinetic energy, mean kinetic energy to temperature, and then you use that to derive that pressure is proportional to temperature from Newton's force. Okay. Using statistical and the mechanics of the paradigm, Wallace in this 2019 paper points out that this isn't sufficient. You can't just connect and derive. You also need some kind of naturalness constraint. This amounts to the requirement that the initial conditions and or parameters at the lower level are not too unusual, okay? Without that extra step, we can't guarantee that we'll end up with deriving regular macrodynamics. So were we to start in a particularly odd initial condition for statistical mechanics, it's possible we could have no stable macrodynamics or unobserved, i.e. entropy reducing macrodynamics. There are all these different possibilities depend on extremely unusual initial conditions. And so what we do is we need to in impose what he calls a naturalness, sometimes also called a typicality constraint at the beginning of doing our, our, doing our before we do our derivation, and then we can end up reducing, okay. So naturalness of initial conditions and parameters is thus a general requirement for bottom-up derivability and reduction of our theory. In the case of our natural effective field theories, there's no claim that the higher energy theory won't determine the lower energy theory, but the suggestion is that our natural effective field theories are strongly emergent because they're just not derivable from the bottom up. So it looks like we violated this really, see, or at least to me, really well-founded, well-justified principle of kind of global theory reductionism. We've always thought, we thought for a long time, lots of those in the kind of physics, philosophy and physics community in, uh, and in general, have assumed that something like reductionism is possible. And it looks like our natural theories violate reductionism in some way because they prevent the bottom-up derivability of our theory. Okay. Some kind of lower energy information about parameters is required to derive the standard model effective field theory from whatever future high energy physics we have. So it looks like naturalness constraint being violated means that this methodology we use for, 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 for derivation of our macrodynamics won't work in this particular case. You won't be able to start out at very high energies and derive everything because you won't be able to. Employing the naturalness constraint will lead you astray. And that's an essential part of the kind of deri derivability process in physical theory. So, are our natural effective field theories irreducible? One might argue they're not, because the parameters are related in the bridge laws rather than the bottom up derivation. Remember, there are two steps in reduction there's the connection step, there's a connectability step, and there's a derivability step. Maybe we can just plug the relation between our parameters into the connectability step. And as such, you're, you're home free. As such, you've got a reduction. And so this argument that effective field theory is irreducible won't go through. So you might worry the freedom to include such correspondence and bridge laws will make reduction trivial. I think that's just not true. I think reduction is very hard and a very complicated process, that even if you're allowed to help yourself to something as sort of hefty as a relation between parameters, I don't think that does much more than 
helping yourself to the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature, I think that you still end up struggling. It's still a kind of non-trivial process to derive one set of laws from another. Okay, so two caveats were applied. First, the ridiculous sensitivity required in unnatural bridge laws is unprecedented. Like, standardly, we might have thought that our bridge laws could relate things in a kind of natural way, that it couldn't be, it wouldn't be that finely tuned, though I'm very hesitant at that kind of locution, it wouldn't be that sensitive. But in this case, we have something totally unprecedented in how precise our bridge law would need to be. But I mean, I don't know what kind of argument that is. This is new. Unnaturalness is new, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. And we were looking for a kind of normative requirement that unnaturalness is not the kind of thing we should want, or is the kind of thing that if we discover it, there's something deeply wrong with our physics. And it doesn't look like being unprecedented is sufficient. Should unprecedentedness undermine reduction? I, I don't think so. But, I look, I've, I've been arguing that, you know, we could, we can get around Wallace's problem or Wallace's problem with derivability by talking about uh, putting stuff into bridge laws, but not just anything can go into bridge laws. So Wallace considers naturalness of initial conditions and of parameters and argues that both are required to avoid strong emergence. But I think they should be distinguished. Naturalness of initial conditions on the one hand and naturalness of parameters on the other. In fact, I agree with Wallace that failure of naturalness over initial conditions could lead to strong emergence. If a wide range of different initial conditions didn't lead to the same macrodynamics, you wouldn't have dynamical robustness. Right? If our gas, if like every time I had a different gas with slightly different initial conditions, I had different macrodynamics, so different high level laws. Pressure was no longer correlated with temperature. If my initial conditions changed, then I just wouldn't have macrodynamics. I wouldn't have dynamical robustness seems to be a consequence of some kind of robustness over initial conditions, some kind of naturalness of initial conditions. So I agree that we need naturalness of initial conditions. So failure of dynamical robustness in extreme cases can indeed lead to very traditional old fashioned strong emergence. If you're looking for configurational forces where the particular microstate, if my particles are arranged thus and so, then my laws are different. That looks like you could even get something as extreme as that if you fail dynamical robustness, if you don't have naturalness of initial condition. So I agree that unnatural initial condition relations can't go in bridge law. But while parameter relations may be admissible to bridge laws, initial conditions aren't. So if we have just naturalness over initial conditions, we should be able to avoid strong emergence. And we should be able to end up saying that maybe parameter naturalness isn't required. But this doesn't establish a case for naturalness over parameters. Naturalness over initial conditions is required, but why have naturalness over parameters? That's what's needed to establish something is wrong with unnatural effective field theory, such as a standard model with a hip. Okay, good. So there are two points of rebuttal to this. I'm sorry, I, I, I feel like I'm just throwing lots of philosophy. Anyway, hopefully it all kind of roughly followable. Okay, so where we got to is, I told you, why I thought that effective field theories are at least as autonomous and emergent as we should ever have expected them to be. And so Bain and Williams' argument that effective field theories, the unnatural effective field theories are deficient because they're not sufficiently autonomous or emergent, I don't think those arguments go through. Now what I'm doing is I'm saying, Wallace's argument looks to me to be in a way better shape because his argument is that there's something wrong with our ability to derive unnatural effective field theories from the bottom up. They seem to spell issues for reductionism in general. 
Ah, oh, I said, I agree with Wallace that we need unnatural, we need naturalness of initial conditions in order for reduction to go through. But do we need naturalness of parameters as well? Now, in order to respond to my argument, what Wallace needs to do is to throw doubt on the parameter initial conditions distinction. So he says that what I'm trying to do, my kind of quick fix, which is to say naturalness of initial condition is required, but naturalness of parameters isn't. He's saying that won't go. Uh, um, in order for me to block his argument, I need to be able to say naturalness of initial conditions is required, but naturalness of parameters isn't for reduction. In order to respond to me, he can just say, well, your parameter initial condition condition uh, initial conditions distinction doesn't work so well. Okay. So he does this here because I'm low on time. I'm just going to, it's in the paper, but I'm going to summarize it here. So if we had unnatural initial conditions, but natural parameters, we could still end up with a normal ma macrodynamic, was what Wallace argues. It, he gives a justification for thinking that natural parameters, even with unnatural initial conditions, would lead to normal macrodynamics. He goes on to say it's only if we have unnatural initial conditions and unnatural parameters that the macrodynamics would not be as we find them. I find this fairly uncompelling. The issue with this argument of natural parameters is we wanted natural initial conditions in any case. In the, if initial conditions are natural, macrodynamics are regular, whatever the parameters. So, so this doesn't seem to me to be a good argument. Um, a broad worry in the EFT case, where are the initial conditions? Do parameters play the initial conditions role? I don't know. Well, this has a second argument. He says physical parameters can be contingent. His example is in the solar system. We can think about the uh, masses of the planets as being parameters, but those are contingent with respect to some underlying physics. This argument is very interesting. In my view, the strongest case presented for parameter naturalness that we can have low energy theories where the parameters are contingent with respect to some underlying theory. That looks like exactly what we are after in justifying naturalness as a requirement on our theories. But it depends in part on new physics. Do we have good reason to think that the standard model parameters are contingent relative to new physics? That's a question, I don't know. I don't know enough about the new physics or the candidates. If contingent, do such parameters vary as initial conditions do for each new system? If I have this box of gas and that box of gas, my initial conditions will be different. Is that what will happen here? If we have parameters that are contingent in the standard model relative to some higher energy physics? And then, and this I think is an interesting question, would such parameter contingent theory solve the naturalness problem? Because if not, if we, had, if we had some new physics that was required in order to make the naturalness argument work, but it didn't solve the naturalness problem, I don't know where we'd be. We'd have come up with some, I mean, now it looks like the naturalness arguments themselves depend on what new physics we find. And they were meant to be heuristics in order to guide our search for new physics. So I don't really know what to do with it. If we end up saying that all our arguments for naturalness depend on exactly how higher energy beyond the standard model physics turn out, then the arguments for naturalness depend on exactly what, I mean, depend on exactly the wrong thing, where they're meant to be used in order to guide that search. Okay, fine. This is a worry. Um, good. And what should we make of that situation? Okay. So I'm sorry, I'm going a couple of minutes over. There is a kind of at least epistemic emergence that we get in effective field theories that is closely related to renormalizability. This emergent may, may be unlike that in other domains in the absence of dynamical robustness. So inferring from other bits of physics to effective field theories as facts, inferring from natural effective field theories to unnatural effective field theories may be better, but then it's unclear quite how that's meant to work theoretically. 
we don't straightforwardly have dynamical robustness. So how do we say, how do we make, take, get conclusions about emergence and effective field theories from other contexts? Okay. Claims that effective field theories should be autonomically robust as other theories is difficult to justify. If our naturalness does block quantum observability, that, however, conflicts with strongly held views about the reduction of nature of the physical world. So, a lesson I drew from the first half of this talk was that dynamic robustness and gnomic robustness should be distinguished. The latter isn't required for the kind of emergence involved in constructing low energy theories without knowing the corresponding higher energy, the high energy theory. I suggested that we need. Dynamic robustness, we don't need dynamic robustness. Wallace's argument casts doubt on this distinction by running together parameters and initial conditions. So the major question is, is he right? Is there really no good distinction between initial condition naturalness and parameter naturalness? And the answer to these questions are continuing on future figures. Okay, I feel like I rushed towards the end, for which many apologies. And hopefully we have some some time for for, for thinking about this and clarification, clarifying the arguments. And et cetera. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions, but I'm sure there are other questions from uh, uh, other participants. So uh, please raise your hand using the uh, reaction button uh, in your Zoom window or the participants window. Again, if you'd like to ask a question uh, anonymously, uh, please send me a direct message using the chat and I'll, I will read your question uh, in the queue order. Um, great. So uh, we have a hand from Alyssa. Alyssa, please go ahead. Hi. Um, uh, thanks, Alex, for the talk. Um, that was re really interesting. Uh, so I wanted to ask about Porter's, uh, that, that argument that you give to him. Um, and I guess I was, I was, so I'm not, you know, I haven't written on this. I'm, I haven't thought about this very much. So this is new to me. So I, this is really intended as a clarificatory question to clear things up because the way you presented it and then your response was, but the standard model with the Higgs mechanism is not natural. I, I felt like the question was whether or not we should think it is. So may, could you go back to the slide where you say like Porter's account of what he means by naturalness? Uh, is that something he's, he's gonna agree with you with in the first place? Um, because it seemed like- This one or- earlier uh, this these ones or yeah yeah um so before that you had just like what he means by naturalness in the first place isn't it just that oh, the... Go back at the beginning yeah so, so i thought sorry it is what we're questioning is whether or not the parameters in the standard model are are contingent based on underlying theory Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of it. I mean, well, okay. It depends what you mean by contingent, I guess. Yeah. Um, but well, was, yeah. So whether or not different, you know, the the underlying theory could be different in certain ways that would make a difference to the values of the parameters in the standard model. Um. I think mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm slightly unclear on what could mean there. So I think that the, the, I, so I think this is important. Yeah, because, I think. Yeah. So, so what's established, what should be clear, is that if you have some parameter at low energy, like the Higgs mass, and you have the sort of corresponding bare mass defined at very high energies, that any unbelievably small change to the bare mass at high energies would lead to massive changes at low energy. So that's not controversial in the sense of that's what we take a kind of paradigm case of our naturalness to be. Mm. One interesting question I think is what, what kind of thing are we imagining when we're imagining changing 
the kind of value of the parameter to find a very high energy? Are we imagining changing something which could change according to possible dynamics that we think like there are in the world? Or are we imagining moving to another possible world which has the same physics except for this particular parameter changed in this other way, but we're acknowledging that that's not the kind of thing to which a physical law could ever change? Yes, so my worry, I guess, was just that in the sense that you're using naturalness, it wasn't clear to me that, um, you know, he was assuming in the first, uh, that he would agree with you that the, um, the standard model with the Higgs is unnatural. But I, but I, I mean, it depends on what you mean here, I guess, by, by natural and how you're, exactly what, I guess, what's fairly insensitive and, and things like that in this definition. Okay, so maybe I've read him differently from you, but I think he would agree with me here. Okay, all right. Yes, directly from him. Okay, all right. Thanks. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, thanks for a great talk. Hey, Alex, uh, excellent talk. Um, so I, I guess I have a question about one of the things that came up when you were talking about, um, uh, so like uh, uh, the correspondence rules. Um, so I'm wondering how you think this, you know, everything you're saying kind of changes if one is persuaded that like just stipulating correspondence rules is an illegitimate move, you know, cause it's like, I guess my inclination is a little bit to to take Maudlin's point about some of this stuff that that you you do need to have some kind of um, like derivable connection between the lower level theory and the macro theory. So so um, do you think any do you think your arguments kind of still go through if one does think that something like that is needed? Good, I guess it depends what we mean by a derivable connection. I mean, like, so, okay, an, an, an unhelpful response is like, something's gotta be true. Like there are some, we gotta get something for free. And maybe parameters are the kind of things that are just like the values of them are never going to be derivable from our physics. They're just, um, they're just parts of the world. And one might, for example, think of one of the lessons. And I think this is, this might be somehow related to something that Josh will say. The like one of the lessons of. Uh, understanding or like the empirical observations of the running of coupling constants is that there's some kind of deep connections between values of parameters at lots of different scales and 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 that uh, is part of the way the world works and we've just discovered that and so does that mean that reduction isn't available to us so well there's a particular kind of strong reductionist program I can imagine in which that's not kind of uh, allowed. That's out. That means the reductionism isn't available to us. But I think that, may, that might just be the wrong way of thinking about reductionism, or that might be too strong. And so to go from that violation of the extremely strong version of reductionism to say that reductionism is altogether out, as it looks a bit like Wallace is saying in the paper, where he's sort of suggesting, you know, this framework for reduction, if it's not available to us, as in the case of unnaturalness, sort of violates our paradigms for reduction throughout the whole of physics. I think he goes a bit too far. I'm not sure that a conclusion quite as strong as that is, 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 is available to us. Does that help at all? Cool. Yeah, thanks. Great. So we're very close uh, to, to the hour. I know Makande, I, I see your hand there. Would it be okay if you uh, could hang out of that question until the discussion period at the end? Will you be around? 
Yep, no problem. Okay, thanks so much. Hang on to that question and I'll keep you first in the queue when we, when we get back. So I wanna give everyone a few minute break. Um, I'll just ask our next speaker, Josh, uh, to share your slides uh, two minutes before the hour and make sure everything is working. Uh, and we'll start one minute after the hour. So take, take a few minutes, everybody. And I wanna thank again, Alex, again, for a fantastic talk. Thanks. <laughs> Great.